Hi everyone, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're awake. I know it's been a tough day. Even before lunchtime, I heard that truth wasn't real and we're all going to become superheroes and it could be quite scary. So don't worry, this is a lot based in reality. So this is the organisation I work for. Um, it was started almost 200 years ago, not quite. This is so old, this was taken 100 years ago. Um, it started, the organisation was started in response to something called the Peterloo Massacre which is where some soldiers marched into a crowd and tried to kill a lot of workers that were demanding the vote. Two years later, they made a newspaper because they were so upset about it. So can you imagine that? It took two years for them to get the story. Um, that'd be very difficult nowadays. And then for about another 160 years, they kind of just did the same thing. It was the same business model. They got people to go out and talk to people they wrote it on a piece of paper, they took that piece of paper to the printers, they printed another piece of paper and they delivered it around the country and people paid money for it. And that was the business model. And then, oh, the other way. And then uh, in 1995 this happened, we released our first website. Um, off the back of this, we pioneered in podcasting, live blogging, data visualization, interactive storytelling, and lots of other things. I arrived in 2007 when the video team was four people and we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, we sort of saw TV news, thought maybe it should be like that, we're not sure. We got about 5,000 views a day and we were really, really happy with it. It was like, yes, 5,000 views a day. All my friends told me I was a complete idiot for doing this because at the time I was working in television and I was getting about two to three million views on the reality television I was making. Two of them work for me now, which is really funny. I always remind them of that story. Um, so what do I do? So I am the executive editor for visual journalism, which means I am in charge of photography, video, virtual reality, audio, graphics, and interactives. Now, the strange thing about this job is it didn't exist 15 years ago. And it probably won't exist in 15 years' time in the same state. And I'm fine with that. Once you get used to the idea of that not being scary anymore, it's quite a cool place to be. So what I'm going to show you is a video of our visual journalism in 2016. It should give you an idea of what something that was traditionally text looks and sounds like. Um, so there's a little video here. Sunday, violence interrupted the memorial space at Place de la Bosse, where riot police dealt with 200 men who invaded the square shouting nationalist and anti-immigrant slogans. We're in my degree, the capital city of Porno State and the birthplace of Bogdan Garan. Anyone who arrives in Australia by boat is sent to Nauru but their detention has become an indefinite incarceration. 96 men, women and children died in a lethal crush on the Lepings Lane Terrace. If one of my kids went to work somewhere and they were two minutes late, they got fined 15 minutes pay, I think that's unreasonable. We should be writing our own Bill of Rights and foisting it on the Europeans! <laughs> We want our country back. The making palaces could put what we're living in. I am the child of immigrants. It's never been so easy to get people to talk about immigration. Far more united and have far more... She has died as a result of her injury. 48 hours till the polls are. It's about four days since Sarah Cox was murdered. A lot of people here want out. Now. Brexit means Brexit. Do you want to be bargain basement Britain on the edge of Europe? Try to be the captain that steers our country to its next. Stand aside. That person cannot be me. You have been chosen by the Conservative Party to become its leader. We're no longer the United Kingdom. Our convention occurs at a moment of crisis for our nation. Lock her up! I don't think there was any racism until Obama got elected. You're going to ask me who I'm going to vote for? Trump! People in this country are hurting. They're not there at that rally because they got nothing better to do. They want to see this country take a turn. We know what's next. If you disrespect them, you disrespect us. How would you describe this election? I will try not to use profanity. 
it will come as no surprise when they follow history's pattern and elect a reactionary, racist, sexist man. I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but the next president of the United States is Donald Trump. It's a reminder that though climate change is a slow-moving crisis, there are junctures when it suddenly speeds up. I'm coming to London to get you. And after I'm full beat him, I think you'll have to join the Beatles and be a singer. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Imagine Martin Luther King never had a dream. And what's that you're thinking? The hijab controls sexuality. Just stop right there. We are gonna win. So that was 2016. I started in 2014 as a head of audio and video. And the first thing that I decided to do is I looked at broadcast news video in England and I was like, who, who watches this? Like, I watch it because I have to, because it's my job. But who watches it? And then I went and I looked at the statistics. I realized the average age of the viewer on BBC One, which is our biggest TV channel, is 61 years old. I went to BBC Two, I thought, oh, maybe it's different there, they have a bit more culture. 62. <laughs> then I went to Channel Four, which is seen as the outsider challenger brand. 60. Um, so I went and had a look at the statistics of people that watch our videos. They're 25 to 35 mainly, and they're mainly female as well. Very different to our traditional newspaper buying audience. So I, I thought, okay, where are they? They're probably not on our website always. So I set up a social team and I thought, I need to get younger people in than me. I was 35 at the time. I'm, I'm too old already for this. So I got two people in in their early 20s, and I said, OK, you guys do this. I'm, I'm going to give you a month. Try and, try and make some nice videos. Um, the first few weeks, they were terrible. And I thought, oh, what have I done? This is a stupid thing. There's a reason people make videos like they do. But then, then they started to get better. So we created a format specifically for Facebook called Dabs. And I'm actually going to show you an example which explains the format, which is slightly meta. And then after it is, is, is one of the examples of one of the things. Um, and these have been really, really huge for us in a way to sort of getting a new audience. Um, we had quite a lot of traditional filmmakers when we first made these look at me and say, like, why are we doing this? This is bullshit. You know, we want to make 10 minute films in dark rooms that no one watches. Um, and they were really shocked because. I really think that there's a, there's a way of storytelling here which is fascinating and which works really well on social, which will help pause your thumb in the first three seconds. And that is a skill to doing that. There is really a skill to doing this and telling it properly. So just because it looks simple, don't think it is simple. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here, hopefully if I hit the right button. Yes. I wanted to see more trust in the world and I was thinking what can I do to contribute to that and I'm a runner and I'm a woman so if I just put on my running shoes and go running through a Muslim country with Sharia laws what will happen? I 
Nu har jag startat på... Fy fan vad jag är skraj. Oj, nu kommer tårarna, men jag kommer jag kom i en kilometer. I believe that most of us, we do have our prejudice. I have lots of prejudice. But when we meet each other, then there is no reason. I mean, we're all humans. All people are beautiful in their own way. So what The Guardian was about and has always been about is holding the powerful to account. And you can only hold the powerful to account if you can find that audience, where that audience is, and deal with them on their own terms. So the most interesting thing about this for me is that I believe that um, our journalism isn't the piece of paper it's written on, or the website it's on, or even if it's shown on TV or a film or a thing on Twitter. Our product is our journalism. Um, and so for me, what we, pre what we preach here is something called responsible reach. Um, we take classic core Guardian stories, stories that it's often quite hard to get an audience for. We use young people to tell them in interesting ways, and you can find a whole new audience for it. Some of the stories that we've done before, uh, my favourite one was um, we did a dab about a... Peruvian protest about forced sterilization, which is an, an amazing story, but very hard to get more than 10,000 people to read something like that. Five million people watched the video on it. We realized that most of those views, for a lot of sensible reasons, were in South America, so we translated the text to Spanish, and another seven million people saw it. And there were young people as well. So if you accept that, if you're a young person in the past, when your parents maybe bought a newspaper, so you buy a newspaper, that doesn't happen anymore. If you're under 18, probably the first time you see The Guardian and The Guardian's journalism is gonna be off platform, with no context, and in video form. So that's a fairly serious responsibility for me. So this is one of the first things we did. Then after that, we decided we wanted to set up a documentary strand, because one of the things that I got told when I started was no one watches videos longer than three minutes. It's impossible, just, just give up. No one watches longer than three minutes. So I said, okay. I want people to watch 20 minute things because I think this is a really interesting way to tell a story that you can't in three minutes. So we built a whole new page and we decided to treat them like theatre releases. We put a social and marketing campaign. We went out to find stories that we thought would be accessible to people and we created a documentary strand. So I'm going to show you two clips from a film called Internet Warriors from the documentary strand um, and then I'll talk about it a little later. When migrants were blocking the road in Calais, in France, I wrote, just run the fuckers over. Ain't changing it. We should just fucking run them over. Send a lot of them back. Don't care where they come from, just send them. Send them all to Turkey. Because they're all coming through there. And Europe's got, in my belief, it is, Europe's got two problems. One, the EU, Brussels, get rid of it. And the second one is like the, what you've got, all these uh, migrants, so-called migrants, from the war in Syria. Thank you, dear. Coffee. Who are the people who spend their lives debating online? Hadde vel verden vært bedre i dag, tror jeg. Tror jeg, merk det. Er lov, er lov å drømme om det? Jo, det er lov til å drømme om en bedre verden, så absolutt. So what I really love about that is something that we always try and do um, in our videos, which is even if you don't agree with what someone says, you give them the space to talk, because they're more complicated than you think. 
And that's about showing respect for your contributors and showing respect for your audience. So, so the first guy there, the actual reason why he hated the EU wasn't just because he was racist, was because he had a Thai wife and she couldn't get in the country. And you don't realise at the start when you see the tattoos and the England flag. Um, so I really, really love this series. And the great thing was we started to get a fairly big audience to it. 350,000 per doc is what you'd get on any cable channel in England. And the thing that really excites me was we're getting about a sort of 40% completion rate, but the average duration was 7 minutes 30. Now, when I started, we couldn't get that over three minutes at all. So we were getting these people, we were giving them interesting stories about what they wanted to hear, and they were rewarding us by watching them. Um, and so for me, what I really like this about this is I don't think news can fit into a half-hour broadcast every night. There's not half an hour of news every night. A story is as long as it is interesting. If you have good enough stories, you can go long, or if you have some stories where maybe you need to catch the attention in three seconds, it's all possible. But again, all this is about having respect for your audience and trying to think, what are we if we're not broadcast video? So the next thing we decided to do is to try out virtual reality. Um, we had a brilliant audio producer called Fran Panetta who wanted to do this. Now, I thought about it, and at the time when we talked about if we should do it, I decided that if a new technology was being built and a new language was being built, I didn't want to just trust to leave it to the brands. Because brands are awesome, but they don't care about you. A brand won't hold power to account usually, unless it's in a sort of Pepsi advert with one of the Kardashians. Um, so we decided that we were going to try and do some journalism in virtual reality. We thought it was an interesting thing to experiment with. So we did this. Welcome to yourself. You're going to be here for 20 hours a day. You are going to undergo many different kinds of reactions. And some of them will be more immediate than others. Keep your eye also quiet. Memorize your space. After a while, things start to slow. I find myself floating. The tall dead trips. This was really successful for us. Um, as you can see there, that's uh, Robert De Niro having a go on it. He quite liked it. Um, but it was really expensive. We had to have multiple partners. It was really hard to do the journalism. You had to find 20 inmates. We had to talk to psychologists. We had to have a whole new language of how we dealt with coders, which is very, very difficult, especially when you're dealing with journalism, when they want to gamify something as much as possible. But you know that's not the right thing. So it was a super interesting experience, but it was expensive and it was very time intensive. So we toured it around festivals as an installation which it eventually ended up on the White House lawn, which was one of the things that we wanted to be able to have some influence to show it to politicians. It ended up on the White House lawn on a festival in the previous administration, by the way. This isn't something I don't think Donald Trump would like on the White House lawn. Um, so we decided to make a virtual reality studio. We, we like to experiment sensibly. We got a lot of money from other people to do this one, but it was very, very expensive. So we signed a deal with Google to make 12 new virtual reality things, and we're using that money at the moment to experiment. Um, so I am going to show you an example of one of the new virtual reality projects we've just been working on called Seapra. I wish you remembered Holmes as I do, Marwa. I wish you remembered the crowded lanes and the evening walks we took with your mother around Clock Tower Square. First came the protests, then the siege, the skies spitting bombs, starvation, burials. These are things you know. I Look at your profile in the glow of this moon, my boy. And I say to you, hold my hand. Nothing bad will happen. You are precious cargo, Marwan. 
I pray the sea knows this. So a lot of what we do with new media is try and find new ways into the biggest stories. The refugee crisis is one of the biggest stories in Europe of our generation, possibly for the whole world. So in one way we do it like that, in another way on the dabs that I showed you, our most popular video ever was the story of a lost cat that a refugee family lost in Turkey and found again in Norway. And my favourite part of that is 30 million people watched it, and it was a very serious producer who, who made it, and he's still upset that that's his most popular work ever. Um, but it is a serious thing. People get fatigue about these big stories, but if you want to hold the power to account, you have to keep telling these big stories and finding new ways to find the audiences on their own terms. So I think that is a lot about what we do here. So we launched the VR studio in October 2016. We've produced seven projects. I think early October, we're distributing 100,000 cardboard devices with our newspaper. And we're looking to experiment, be collaborative, and we're working across commercial and editorial. What I really love about this, this is of no cost to my organization whatsoever. We get to innovate, we get to have fun. No one tells us what we do with that money, but it's of no cost, which is pretty important when you run independently by a trust and you're still losing money at the moment. So, it is difficult to do this, and I think I'm going to end my talk by just giving you a list of things that I've found out over the last few years while I've been trying to figure this out. So, the first one's pretty obvious, find sensible ways to explore new things. You know, try and do it for less money than you would normally, try and do it in a way where you can leverage your journalism and the things that you're uniquely good at. The second one is don't put all your eggs in one basket. I call this the MySpace rule. If anyone here built a business on MySpace, you'd be screwed. Don't do it again. Spread your risk out, take multiple small bets, have a think about it. The third one is employ for attitude. I like to build teams that are great and can do new things, and if that thing doesn't work, I can move them over to here. And I know they understand the structure of trying to make that successful in that one place, and I can move it over there. Because often when you're working with off-platform things, when you're in no control of the algorithm whatsoever, things can literally change overnight. So if you build a team that's like okay with that, and you know you can move them over to there, it's a really useful thing. Give yourself and your staff a chance to explore and fail. I know that's difficult in the newsroom. I'm sure anyone that's ever worked in the newsroom know that it's tough when you get things wrong. But sometimes you have to be allowed to fail. Under that... Organizational culture change is really difficult. It's hard, people don't like it. They want to carry on with their lives, they want to be comfortable. But it's also possible. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it just because it's difficult. Um, and not all innovation is the big stuff you talk about on stage. Um, this is me on stage talking about the big stuff. But there's lots of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that once they've done it or once you've made a change, you can't believe a time without it. We have our own in-house analytics, and it's one of the most incredible life-changing experiences for how you understand an audience. So I'd say that's really important. You know, it's not the stuff that other journalists like that wins awards that you talk about on stage. Sometimes just realizing things like, you know, your audience might not be on your platform is important. And also being honest about success and failure. I hope I have been honest with you guys today. Um, and I guess it's probably time for questions now. Thank you. Gracias, Cristian. Muchas gracias. Por favor. Cristian. Maybe there's people in the audience who is not familiar with the economic operation of The Guardian. What's the rationale of The Guardian's operation for everybody? So, um, The Guardian is owned by a trust. Um, they have about a billion left in the bank at the moment. Um, I think three years ago we were losing about 50 million a year. We'll probably lose about 10 million this year or something like that. And I think within a year we'll be down to breaking even, hope, hopefully. Um, having a trust is the most amazing thing in the world. We're not owned by a billionaire. We're not owned by anyone that can say anything to us. So we've been able to do stories in the past that other organizations wouldn't have been able to do because of their ownership structure. But having said that, working in a news organization now is like tap dancing on quicksand. It's difficult, stuff keeps changing. 
you all probably have seen the advertising market falling apart. So at the moment, we have a strategy of membership, which is trying to keep everything open. And if you like it, give us money. I prefer that to a paywall because I want everyone to be able to read when we're trying to hold the power to account. But, you know, we're working on that at the moment. It's very early days still, but I think there's positive signs there that we'll break even in the next year and a half. Okay, I understand that given the nature of the Guardian, they cannot work with the number of companies who have conflicting ideologies or economic interests. That is to say, uh, there are restrictions to how it operates on the market. Isn't that so? Yeah, there are some restrictions. I mean, there's hard restrictions of, of people that we just don't work with, and, and there's soft ones. I mean, again, this is about trust and this is about audience. If you're a big newspaper about climate change and it's right next to a huge advert for petrol, are they going to listen to you? Probably not. So one of the things we care the most about at the moment is, is trust in your audience. And we've actually rated really highly on a few academic things on who's the most trusted in the media, especially in a time of fake news. So I don't think it's just uh, an economic thing of, uh, okay, we don't work with those guys, so it's harder to make money. I think it's really about the way we want to live our life and live our values, and, and it makes me happy to work there for those reasons. Perfect. We uh, could see that among the projects that are a part of, of the Guardian, the ones it bought or are part of, are the Kipu project. Uh, Chani Gujot mentioned it, and tomorrow we'll learn more about it, tomorrow at 9 a.m. The director is here. So for the colleague, the producers in Argentina, the independent producers and the company, how can they uh, co-produce or participate with the Guardian? What are the, the ways forward? Do they buy contents? How do you make it? So um, we love to work with partners. I'm not stupid. I don't think all the best stories in the world come out of London or people that were born near London. Um, I think there's lots of brilliant stories around the world, especially things like the, the documentary. Uh, the documentary strand that we've got is about having unique access to things. You guys here, producers here, have probably got a lot of unique access to things I've never even seen or heard about before. So we're always open to working with people, you know. We try and find brilliant stories from wherever they come from. The absolute best stories can come from the most diverse places, which is one of the reasons why I come to South America to talk, you know. I think it's really important to get out there and talk to people in the world because we are well past the point where it's a group of very academic journalists that sit in their little high tower and occasionally they just throw down a little bit of knowledge and you should all be thankful and happy for that. We're past that point, and I'm really happy we're past that point. But that means that we have to find brilliant, diverse ways to work with new people. So, you know, if you want to contact me, I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter. My email's about places. You know, I can put you in contact with the right people if you've got the right story. Brilliant. Now we open the floor for questions. Any questions for Christian here? I would like to know how much the site feeds from um, stories that you receive directly from the readers from the site or from the journal itself. Um, I probably can't tell you percentages, but I can tell you some of the best stories I've worked on have come from the strangest of places. Um, say, for example, if you look at the Internet Warriors documentary that we just showed, that was from a Norwegian director I met at a conference. And he just goes, oh, I've got some of these videos online about these guys I've been following for two years. What do you think? And there's part of you that's like, oh, I wonder if he's just a bit weird. And then he showed me the videos, and I was like, oh, these are amazing. And then we started working together. So on that level, we work like that. But on another level, we have something called uh, Witness, which is a user-generated uh, tool that helps people um, find stories. We also, on the front of our website, have a, a secure way of getting stories to the journalists, as we did things like Snowden and things like that. It's really important, especially for whistleblowers, to be able to have a secure way of contacting us. But 
I mean, I was asked in Brazil about what I thought my trends for the future would be. Um, and I can't talk about technology or formats or things like that, but the only thing that I think will be guaranteed success in the future is trying to understand your audience more and listen to your audience more and serve their needs more. And I think that's what we have to get really, really serious about as journalists in the future. Bien, otra pregunta. Any other question for Christian? More questions? Yeah, here. You were telling about the video on the cat that was one of the most seen ones. And there's a theory saying that if an alien came here and said, how many videos on cats are there? They would think that we are dominated by cats. So what do you think that the audience is after nowadays? And whether the role of journalism is changing towards something more entertainment-like and less information? like so I don't think you can mistake getting the right format for the right platform as, as journalism just being entertainment I take dabs deadly seriously I think they are the perfect format for a mobile phone for a three second thumb pause for someone that's moving you know they're not sat in front of a TV anymore they might have two seconds between something it comes up on their feed so I think journalism is changing to serve the way the audience consumes journalism right We don't all sit in front of the TV and watch half an hour at night. We don't all go and buy a newspaper and read it all day. I wish, I, I wish we did. Um, that'd be great for me if everyone went out and bought a newspaper. But, um, so yeah, I don't think it's about entertainment. I think the audience is as interested as it's ever going to be. But it's a new, younger audience, right? And you have to go to them on their own platforms, on their own terms, and you have to talk to them and understand what they want and start to serve them with things that they want and to be able to tell those stories. You know, we, I joke that it's a cat story that got us the biggest thing. You know, the next three biggest ones after that are very serious news stories. Um, and we do that on Facebook, when everyone said Facebook was just about videos of people falling over and cats, right? So we do do it there. It's really great for that. So, yeah, it, it's a difficult one to say. I don't think it's entertainment. I think if you want to make a cheap amount of money, go for entertainment. There's lots of business models where you just steal videos from everywhere, get the cheapest laugh you can, and be really happy with it. But, you know, if you want to hold the power to account with original journalism, it's a little bit more expensive, it's a little bit more harder, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. Bien, la última pregunta. Okay, and now, last question here at the front. Hi. I would like to ask you if you are surprised when doing the ranking of the top scene or top red uh, in your opinion as per uh, your consideration on what people would like. Is it a surprise for you or something you think that, uh, well, I love it, this is going to be great, it happens that nobody sees it, there's no audience or the other way around? Um, I think everyone that makes things wants it to be seen. I don't know any video producer that makes a video and says, yes, seven people have watched this and only three of them finished it. So part of my job is to get these talented and brilliant people and find them an audience and find them an audience and help them make things that that audience wants to see. Um, the sort of top 10 that we have at the moment, it's a mixed bag on The Guardian, but you'd be very surprised that there's a lot more serious stories than you'd expect. Like, it, it really is. My favorite story about the election that just went, the most watched video in the British election was the video about a disabled woman who couldn't have access to her flat. She'd been a a asking to get a new flat from the government for two years. 11 million people watched this video. It wasn't an easy video to watch. And within two weeks after we made the video, the government gave her a new flat because they were embarrassed. Right, that's not the video. If, if I could have placed a bet at the start of the election of which was the most popular video, I would never have said that. But I was very pleased by it. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Christian. Thank you very much, Christian. It's an honor having you, you here. Muchas gracias.